in the living room. You as a Christian are willing to bet your life that there's enough evidence to prove Jesus existed and what he said was true, et cetera, et cetera. It's not just an idle curiosity. You are actually betting your life on earth, and if there's life afterwards, that one too, that all of this is true. That's a lot more. I would not bet my life on my great-great-grandfather existing, you know, who he was, the details of his life, et cetera, et cetera. And there's probably a lot better evidence for him than there is for a Jesus. The fact that you would make such an awesome investment in time, effort, et cetera, and be willing to die for it on such minimal evidence, if there even is any evidence, I think is not a wise choice in one's life. Well, it also illustrates what we're talking about. Uh, these women would be in the same position, right? They, have, they would have no better access to the evidence necessarily than you do now. Uh, and, but yet they would fanatically believe it and they would, you know, uh, repeat it the same way Muslims would, the same way Buddhists would, the same way even Mormons would. Uh, you know, there are probably plenty of Mormons who would endure torture and death insisting that the golden plates existed, uh, even though there's, it's pretty doubtful that they did. Uh, so, so that doesn't really prove anything. But anyway, Pliny doesn't actually s reference any historical Jesus. He just says they worship a Christ. Uh, but if he did get this Christ story from them, they would have gotten it from the Gospels, because that's all the information that we see in the story that's in Tacitus, if even that is authentic. Um, <clears throat> but I'd like to bring up, you'd mentioned, uh, I wasn't going to mention it because I thought it was too, uh, too much detail to include in such a short debate, but you mentioned Philo. Uh, in actual fact, he says that the figure in Zechariah 6 is an archangel, in particular, an archangel who is the firstborn son of God, God's high priest, celestial high priest, not the earthly high priest, the image of God, <clears throat> and God's agent of creation. And these are all attributes that we find Paul and the book of Hebrews assigning to Jesus, their Jesus. And it just so happens that the figure in Zechariah 6 that he's referring to is named Jesus in Zechariah 6. So we're looking at an amazing improbability here. We have someone writing before Christianity originated. He's already acknowledging that there is an archangel who has all of these peculiar attributes that was recognized in the Jewish angelology. And then we have Paul coming along. He didn't necessarily read Philo, because uh, this is probably just an angelology that's known widely. But Paul comes along and is talking about the exact same Jesus, who is the agent of creation, the firstborn son of God, God's celestial high priest, which we have in the he in book of Hebrews, and the image of God. He's talking about the same kind of Jesus. That's really unlikely coincidence, unless they're actually talking about the same angelology figure, the same figure from Jewish angelology. Now, they're probably writing independently of each other, referring to a common angelology tradition within Judaism at the time. Uh, and the reason we can come to this conclusion is because the, the, it would be an enormously improbable coincidence otherwise. Uh, so that's, yeah. that's the basis for that. Yeah, well, and I understand that. I, I love Philo, and I think Philo has some tremendous insights. And it's almost like he is, you know, his discussion of the Logos is something that, you know, I as a Christian be like, it, it rings nicely in my ears, okay? Uh, that, that the, you know, that the word um, Yehoshua, or Yeshua at that case, uh, it's, I, I did not see it in the text, so I, I, I'm not sure where you got that. That well, was not in the actual text. He's, he's saying that the figure in Zechariah yes. 6 is this figure. Yes. The figure in Zechariah 6 happens sure. to be named Jesus. I mean, yeah. he would know that. He was an expert sure. on the scriptures. So, yes, indeed. Yeah, he doesn't have yeah. to actually you know, fill out the whole scriptures yeah. for you. It's not you know, I mean, The thing is, there was a, of course, as you know, there was this huge messianic expectation, right? Ever since the fall of Adam and Eve, there had been this growing anticipation that somebody... The mm -hmm. seed of the woman, and then it comes to the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, etc., until you know it goes through David, and and it gets bigger yeah. and bigger and bigger. So we know that uh, there were many many um, sects of Judaism that were very much expecting some kind of a Messiah figure, right? And so yeah, but Philo's not talking about a messianic figure. He's talking about a pre-existent celestial being, an angel, an archangel. He says specifically, the idea of using this archangel as the Christ, as the Messiah, that seems to be the Christian innovation. Well, I, I, I disagree with that. If you go back to the, the Targumim, you will find the Memra. And the Memra is uh, what we translate in, into Greek as the Logos. And, yeah. and that is it's the same idea. So he was this intermediary being between, let's call him God the Father or yeah. God Almighty. Yeah, oh, certainly an intermediary right? being. So there That's was not the same thing as the Messiah, though. Well, I understand your nuance, but, mm -hmm. you know, they all... I'm just trying to figure out what your argument is. I don't quite... Well, I'm responding to, okay, to the idea that, that Philo uh, was, um, 
that there was this great expectation of the Messiah back then. So oh, yeah. so so maybe it's just a misunderstanding of the evidence, what the relevance of the Philo's passages. What Philo establishes is that there was already an archangel named Jesus who has all the attributes that the Christians are. So they're talking about the same archangel. And this is before Christianity. So you don't actually need a historical Jesus to explain where they're getting the idea of this particular being. And, and Paul specifically says that he, his Jesus is a pre-existent being. He's the agent of creation. And he existed before. Yes, and of course the Hebrew yeah, scriptures so they, talk about that. They're talking about the right? same figure. And what yeah. happens is that the Christians appear to have taken this angel from Jewish angelology and then created a story of him descending, becoming incarnate, and resurrecting in order to be the messianic figure who would... Well, well, this is where this is where prophecy comes in, right? I mean, this yeah, is where using prophecy we as have. Their I mean, the the Hebrew scriptures have a ton, a ton of prophecy about the one who would come, mm -hmm. you know. And of course, his name is Jesus. Uh, he is the Messiah. He's the one that did not open his mouth. Uh, I I thought it was interesting that. Uh, are you saying there's a passage in the Old Testament that says the Messiah will be named Jesus? I'm interested. No, in I'm, that. I'm not interested. Oh, okay, no, I didn't know that. I thought that would have been interesting. That, <laughs> that would have been interesting, yes. Uh, well, he's called, of course, the branch. He's called the servant mm -hmm. of the Lord. Uh, we believe, uh, based on the many references, that the uh, Malach Adonai is a reference to uh, the pre-incarnate Jesus. So, yes, he was yeah. a figure who was hanging out in the presence of God or whatever. And then he, the, it says the word became flesh right. and dwelt among us. That's so, the Christian innovation on this Jewish angelology. Well, yeah. it, it's the maybe the Christian culmination. Maybe that's the way to put it. But there was already a lot of, uh, un, there was already a lot of expectation apart from the, the quote unquote Christians. Yeah. Yeah. That, that doesn't negate any of the, the point we've made. So <laughs> yeah, sure. A bit, what, what, what my point, what I would like to point out, though, is that this idea that, that Paul is, like, you, you make a reference in what I was watching one of your, uh, your debates uh, or your presentations, and you're saying that 1 Corinthians 15, uh, the word there uh, for according to, that, that Paul wasn't, basically, he never really had a real vision of Jesus, but he was getting everything, kind of digging it out of Scripture itself. And the word kata there in the Greek, it, it can be according to, but it can also be in accordance with. Sure. All right. So, you know, I can say I got something, you know, according to so-and-so, this is what it means, or in accordance with so-and-so. So that the nuance there exists in that word, and it doesn't mean that Paul yeah, was... That, that leaves you know, us un, uncertain which he meant, right? And the key thing is in, in 1 Corinthians 15, there's, he just says that. He just says, according to the scriptures, these things happen. He doesn't mention anyone seeing them. He doesn't mention... Right, but we, go, but we can go back to Acts, right? I mean, we have... Well, uh, that's not back to. That's forward. Now we're talking about, you know, 60 to 100 years later. Well, I'm talking about the events. Uh, and, of course, it wasn't 60 to 100 years later. That's... Well, the, uh, actually, just, the mainstream view now is that Acts was probably written sometime around 110 or 115 AD. Well, um, uh, certainly after 93, because it's actually using Josephus as a source. Is <laughs> that true? No, it isn't. Go ahead. Well, you've got a lot of. I guess I don't think I have sound. It just I? needs to okay. be closer. Yeah. Yeah, First Corinthians 15. It talks about for I've delivered you unto you the first. That which I received. Now, when did Paul receive this? Most people think it was about 32, 34 A.D. when he met with the apostles. Well, and, uh, he, he says he got it directly from Jesus in Galatians 1. Well, he says yes, this he, is, he didn't receive it through teaching. He received it through revelation. They, and only many years later he met, met with the, the apostles. apostles. And they think mm -hmm. it was about 32, 34 B.C. And what they were doing is this was Well, it have been creed. years later that he met the apostles, though, or the other apostles. He, he himself says it was at least three years later. Yeah. So he says, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas and then of the twelve. This was the Christian creed. This was yeah. going on right after Jesus died. I know. That's why it's weird that the ministry is not included in it. The idea that Jesus actually walked around and taught the gospel and actually handpicked disciples. This would be like handpicking the disciples would be one of the most crucial parts of the gospel, I would think, especially if they're relying on the tradition coming from the disciples, and yet it's completely missing from 1 Corinthians 15. He just skips right over it as if it didn't matter or it didn't exist. Right, but you know, you know as an author, you can't footnote everything you say. I mean, Well, but you include extremely vital information like that. I mean, right, if, but if, but if, if, if the gospel, common is, dependent, knowledge, if if the gospel already, is dependent on the witness of the disciples to the life of Jesus, that is literally the most important part of the gospel, and yet it's not in there. 
But if this is already common knowledge, if you don't have to go back and explain... Well, if it was common knowledge, you wouldn't need to repeat the whole thing, right? So was the crucifixion of Jesus. So is that he appeared to Kephas. That's all common knowledge, too, and yet he's including that. Well, I mean, these, these letters are not to give a full expose of Jesus. They were, they were a letter, okay? You're well, no, he's, he's, he's reciting the, the fundamental gospel. He's saying this is, the, this is the gospel that we believe in. This is, the right. most, he, this is our most fundamental and important he, teaching. He's, he's repeating the, the basics, the basics. The, the basic creed. Yeah. Okay. Jesus pre preaching to, teaching, and selecting the disciples, that was probably I mean, more basic than all the other stuff. <laughs> I mean, it, with people you already know, you have a, uh, an established history. You don't have to go back and give everything that but you've ever talked But that's what he's doing about. in 1 Corinthians 15. He's going back and repeating the gospel that they preach. Exactly. Yeah. That's what he's doing. He's preaching the gospel. He's not talking about selecting the apostles. He's yeah, but the I disciples. would think that's, that's the most true, especially the in, most in the passage where he's talking about why... From the dead. That's the important thing. That is the gospel. Well, no, the appearances are the most important thing as well. I mean, the other stuff is important too, but he only gets to the idea of Jesus appearing to anyone after his death. There's no ministry in there. There's no handpicking of disciples. There's nothing fundamental like that going on in this passage. That's weird. And at the very least, it's the missing... You you. It's gone. The evidence isn't there. You can't say there were there was a life of Jesus. There was a ministry. There were disciples being handpicked by him in life. When Paul never mentions any of those things ever happening, and yet he mentions all these other things happening, the crucifixion and the burial and the appearances afterwards. It's already met mentioned in the Gospels. He doesn't need to mention it again. Well, then he wouldn't need to mention all the other things either. Right, but if you go on, he, he's he's establishing a point so that he can then go on. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some of you say there is no resurrection from the dead? Right, so he's, he's establishing the point that he's already made, yeah. right? Just like you, you, you give a recap right. of what you said. You don't have to give everything, all the evidence, and all 500 pages mm, of what you said. Not, one line. Right. Uh, he, he taught, well, taught that what, he selected disciples, he, and then he, he appeared to the disciples that he selected. So if he had said that, you would believe it? Uh, well, yes. If, if that was in the authentic letters, that would establish historicity for sure. If they said that he was actually teaching a ministry... In so like so Saturday, that one little line should have been in there to establish sure. historicity. Sure, one, one line would be pretty powerful evidence for the historicity that, of Jesus. That would completely change you from an atheist to a believer. Oh, no, that doesn't... I already established that I can accept a historical Jesus. I'm not going to immediately leap to believing that Jesus is God. <laughs> I did earlier. I, well, I, but I, I forgot it, like so you, should, you need to repeat that and tell me that again. Okay, <laughs> because, you know, I... That's that's silly. No, well then what you're saying no, is silly. This is, this is ridiculous. What you're saying is silly. No, that no, he has to go back talking, and, and establish we're everything. About the He's of going Jesus. on to make a point about about the resurrection. The whole chapter is about the resurrection. So he's given just kind of the, the very basic. Remember, guys, this is what we talk about. Remember that. Now let me go on from there. Now that I've established where I'm going. Here, let's talk about this resurrection thing. Yeah, but okay. what he says is not like I'm going to skip parts. He actually says I'm repeating to you what I taught you. So he's actually summarizing what the gospel is. And we get the same thing in Philippians 2 uh, and various other places where he actually summarizes the gospel. The ministry's not there. There's no hand-picked disciples. They're, no one's even referred to as a disciple. Even in 1 Corinthians 15, they're not called disciples. Uh, one, one thing about the apostle Paul. Uh, how did Paul come to believe in Jesus according to the New Testament? Uh, Paul was alive around the time that the historical Jesus should have been living. Uh, he helped persecute the Christians. He heard the stories. Uh, he held the coats when Stephen was being stoned. Uh, what convinced Paul was what we would call an hallucination, what you would call a vision. Paul wasn't convinced by any historical facts, figures, arguments, debates, or any of that stuff. He was knocked off his, excuse my French, ass by this Jesus. And then all of a sudden he decides, oh, maybe Jesus was who he said he was and it was real, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The only evidence Paul really had for the Jesus of the New Testament was an hallucination. And I don't think that's a valid foundation to base one's life on. Joseph Smith had hallucinations too. Why aren't you Mormon? Okay. I mean, this is kind of this is kind of uh, pedantic because, um, you know, I don't base everything on the Apostle Paul. I accept what Paul said, and the fact that he had a vision, I don't find that uh, crazy. All right, but if he were the only person I were basing what I believe the scriptures are saying, then yeah, maybe there's an issue. But you have all these other evidences. Uh, Luke himself, according to uh, Sir Ramsey was a first-rate historian. 
So uh, he, he gives us all kinds of evidence of things that were, that were where they were supposed to be. Uh, to, to, to suddenly say that it was all just made up and it was all just a bunch of hooey, uh, I, I don't accept that as being valid. Um, Sir Ramsey, that's over 100 years old, by the way. So? Um, I mean, it's still true, right? Uh, well, the methodology of history was substantially inferior then. Uh, Ramsey's been refuted multiple times in the last 100 years on this by, point. By who? Uh, well, the latest scholarship is collected by Richard Purvo in his commentary on Acts for the Hermeneia series. Um, many other scholars concur with him on this. Uh, no, no, Luke is a terrible historian. Not only, I mean, he's, he's also a dishonest historian. Um, he not only does he get wrong some of the things that he borrows from Josephus, he gets chronology wrong and things like that, uh, but he also uh, completely reverses and alters the story that we get from an eyewitness account in Paul. When Paul writes in Galatians, uh, he was never known to anyone, never seen by, uh, never seen by anyone in Jerusalem. He wasn't a Jerusalem person. Uh, when he converted, he was outside of Judea at the time. Uh, and then went to Arabia to preach the gospel, and then for three years, and then later came back and eventually went to Jerusalem. Acts has him in Jerusalem from the beginning, uh, it does not have him go to Arabia ever, uh, and has him immediately go to uh, the apostle, the other apostles in Jerusalem. So at Luke is completely rewriting history because he's writing the story he wants to be true, but he's completely going against this eyewitness source, Paul himself, telling us what actually happened. Uh, so we know Luke is not a reliable historian, and that's just one among many examples of this. very much. A round of applause for both sides. Yes. Perhaps I should have said, let's get ready to rumbo. <laughs> and now, audience members, you have been great, but it's your chance to ask the questions that you have for our panelists. So we do have a microphone here, and if someone wants to go ahead and line up, no more than five in a line at a time, that way we're not just standing around. And make sure your microphone is on there. Okay, as you pose your question, be mindful of the other audience members that are waiting behind you. Be brief if you have a particular individual who you want to answer the question, call out their name. Again, there's Richard there and Mark, as well as David and Doug, or you can just pose the question and they'll answer. Are we ready? Mr. Timer, this segment will also be 30 minutes. You may begin, thank you. Primarily to Richard, but also to Mark. Um, while you may have presented things that had to do with whether or not there was a lack of historicity, I would ask you whether or not that would satisfy the burden of showing that, in fact, he never existed, as opposed to that there was a lack of evidence. Right. Yeah, that was the point of my bringing up that we have an alternative explanation of the, of the evidence. When we look at uh, other precedents of the sorts of things that have happened with other non-existent people being put into history, and when we look at, for example, Paul's uh, discussions appears to be of a celestial being. We have evidence of a Christian sect who did regard Jesus as only a celestial being. And the idea of him being in history only comes uh, basically a lifetime later, what was then an average lifespan later, uh, in stories that are highly mythicized in, in their content. Uh, so when we look at the particular story arc, the, the pattern of evidence, uh, it looks like the pattern of evidence we see with people who didn't exist and were in, basically put into history later. Uh, and that's why uh, I think we can ha conclude that he didn't actually exist, because there, there isn't the same Jesus in Paul, and, and it's only many decades later that we get a sort of pretense of a historical Jesus, and there's no other evidence to support the contrary. And uh, I, I would like to point out, again, from my little uh, reading that I did, uh, Jesus was the goose that laid golden eggs. It's totally implausible that the Romans, the Jews, and everybody else who knew about Jesus would have just gone ahead and killed him. The fact that Jesus was never put into service by the Romans uh, proves to me beyond the shadow of a doubt that the Jesus of the New Testament never existed. If we had a person today that could walk on water, predict the future, heal people, bring people back from the dead, uh, grant immortality, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you'd be darn certain there'd be people that would kidnap him, enslave him, whatever, and force him to do their will. That never took place, therefore that Jesus never existed. The Romans weren't that stupid. Yeah, I, we didn't get to uh, have a little rebuttal on what Mark had said. Um, first of all, I don't think the Romans were 
desperate for anybody. They thought they could handle things just fine. Uh, secondly, I don't think Jesus, as you so pointed out so eloquently, uh, he wouldn't be kidnapped by anybody. He was his own man doing his own thing. He decided to lay his life down when he felt like it. And so I think you need to at least go back and consider part of the story uh, that um, your scenario is just out there. I mean, uh, it's not going to be true for the Romans because they're going to go conscript some loser uh, Jew, okay? And, and it's not going to be true for Jesus because if he is who I believe he was, then he wasn't someone to be pushed around. He could do exactly what he wanted to. Next question. Yes. How do we know that the Gospels are anonymously written? I'll direct this to Richard. And how do we know when they were written? Oh, yes. Um, well, there's two, two reasons for that. I mean, first, all of the Gospels are actually titled kata with the name following it. Uh, and that in Greek is how you designate source, not author. Uh, you would use a different form of Greek to designate author. So when those names were originally attached, someone was actually claiming that those names, whoever they were, we don't even know who they were, uh, were the sources for the authors, not the authors themselves. Uh, and, and this you can find in, in mainstream scholarship uh, on, on, this, on this subject. Uh, but we also don't know who they are. I mean, it doesn't say who they are. So we don't, they, it could have been written by those people with those names. We have no idea, but we just still don't know who these people are. Uh, so anonymity isn't necessarily the point. Uh, the problem is we don't know who they are. Uh, and they don't claim to be eyewitnesses either. Uh, and they, we know they're not because we know Matthew, for example, copies Mark verbatim. Uh, so Matthew can't be an eyewitness because you wouldn't just copy verbatim some other dude who's not an eyewitness. You would actually tell your own eyewitness story. Uh, there's many evidences like that. Now, dating. Uh, dating is more complicated. Uh, obviously, the Gospels don't say when they're written, which is unusual for histories. Normally, histories would say when they're written. They often do um, in, the, in the ancient world. Uh, but uh, what we do have in the Gospel of Mark are many references to the destruction of the Jewish temple, uh, and many scholars find various places in this, and we know that occurred in 70 AD. So we know Mark is writing after that. Now, scholars actually vary widely into where Mark was written, so there are some scholars who think he was written after 140 AD. Uh, it, that's possible, but uh, the earliest he could have been written would be the 70s AD. Now, there's also... Uh, Mark's crucifixion narrative has many, it's about 20 parallels with another narrative of a, a different Jesus. Jesus ben Ananias, who was killed in the, in the, during the war uh, in the 60s AD. Uh, a story that's told in Josephus' Jewish War, which was written, we know, because Josephus tells us, in 75. Uh, so you could possibly even say that the Gospel of Mark is using that particular passage in Josephus and was writing after 75, for instance. So these are the kinds of things we look for. And we know then, of course, Matthew and Luke copy Mark, so they had to have been written later. Uh, Luke inserts a lot of historical color, a lot of little historical details that we know he's getting from Josephus, particularly because the mistakes he, make, he, mistakes he makes in doing that can only be explained by him using Josephus. Uh, so, and, and using Josephus, another book Josephus wrote, which was the Antiquities, which we know because Josephus tells us, was written in 93. So we know Luke was written after 93. Uh, and there are some scholars who argue that Luke is even writing after Papias, uh, which would put him much later, um, 10 to 20, 30 years later even. So, and this is still debated within the field, but that's how you try to date them. You look for evidence that they're written after certain points in time, or that they're using certain sources that you can date, and so on. And as far as the gospel authors being historians, uh, a lot of atheists bring up the question of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. All the apostles are asleep. All the apostles are hundreds of feet away. Nobody is listening to the prayer of Jesus. If these are historians, how did these historians, word for word, manage to cough up the exact words of Jesus' last prayer to God? Obviously, the authors of the Gospels either made this stuff up or they had some delusions, hallucinations, and they were given this information by revelation, the same way Joseph Smith got his stuff. Uh, an historian would not have put words into Jesus' mouth like is done in the Gospels. Nobody was awake. Only Jesus was there. Yeah, I'd just like to say that uh, according to Papias, uh, Matthew first wrote the gospel in Hebrew. So we have there that he says that he um, recorded the oracles in Hebrew and later interpreted them into Greek as best he could, it says. You do know why that can't be true of our Matthew, right? Why? He's copying the Greek of Mark. 
Well, unless, of course, he wrote it in Hebrew. No, you mean if Mark wrote in Hebrew? No, if uh, Matthew wrote in Hebrew. Matthew's copying the Greek of Mark verbatim. He can't possibly have written in Hebrew and also at the same time copy some other source in Greek verbatim. Assuming, I mean, there's lots of debate as to whether Matthew or Mark came first. Oh so, well, okay. Now you're, now you're getting now you're getting pretty wild in the uh, outside getting, the fringe. No, it's not outside fringe the, at all. It's, it's, view. Well, um, if you're going to propose that Matthew wrote first, yeah, uh, then you have the problem that Ma when Matthew actually starts quoting the Bible, he's quoting the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Bible. Uh, so clearly, he couldn't have written in Hebrew if he's using an, again a Greek source. Well, uh, of course, if the Hebrew. if it was in Hebrew, but then it was translated into Greek, just like Papias says. Then maybe he would use the Greek trans, uh, the, the Septuagint, in that Greek version of his gospel. But the problem is, for example, in the Sermon on the Mount, you look at Dale Allison, for example, on his study of the Sermon on the Mount. The arguments and the statements in the Sermon on the Mount are based on the Greek. In other words, if they were based on the Hebrew, the the sermon wouldn't make any sense. So whoever's composing the sermon is actually using the Greek as it the basis for their story or the why basis of their. It account. wouldn't work. Why wouldn't it work in Hebrew? Well, you can read Dale Allison on this. I cite him in okay. my book on the historicity of Jesus. Okay. But there's the actual structure of the argument made is based on certain passages, the way they're written in the Greek, and it's different than it's written in the Hebrew, and it wouldn't make as much sense. Uh, and this is how we know the Sermon on the Mount was composed in Greek, and it wasn't composed in Hebrew. So you, you reject Papias outright and say that it's just... Well, there's two possible things. First of all, Eusebius. Even Eusebius says pa Papias was unintelligent and not reliable. He didn't like him, okay. Uh, but uh, also, he could be referring to some other source. He could be confused. There's he, another Papias who's no, no, the disciple be, of... There, there could be Polycarp another... Polycarp who's the disciple of There John? could be another Matthew that's not our Matthew. I hate to interrupt you, gentlemen, but okay. that may be a topic for another yeah, debate. That's true. I see our line yeah, steadily right. growing. Well here, done. So let's go. <laughs> Ahead with our next question. Please. All right, uh, this is a comment for Mark, and I wanted to respond to your th thought that why didn't the Romans try to take this power that Jesus was displaying? And um, I just wanted to see your thoughts on what what I'm thinking is that uh, that they actually did try, and um, and the the way I w read the Bible is that uh, at the end of Jesus' life, he was questioned by both Pilate and by Herod. And they, and they tried to kind of see, well, what's this guy all about? And, and they had their chance. And I think maybe they were trying at that time to see, well, can we take advantage of this guy in some way? And, for, and Pilate tried, and then Herod tried, and they just tossed him back and forth. But he didn't give him an opportunity. He basically was silent. And so I, th I, I would counter that they tried to see, <laughs> what can I get from Jesus? But he just didn't give him the opportunity. And so, so I think that I would counter your argument with that. Okay. May I suggest that the speakers uh, respond instead of discuss? That would move along the line yeah. quite quickly. Okay. Uh, my, my response to that would be the United States, after 9-11, took uh, about 900 prisoners from al-Qaeda, etc. Uh, the goal was to get them to talk, to get them to cooperate. They didn't just walk up to... Uh, an Al-Qaeda member and say, excuse me, would you please cooperate with us? And the guy says, no, of course not. Oh, okay, you're free to go. Uh, some of those people are still in prison today. And the United States is waiting for their cooperation. Uh, Pilate, Herod, etc. if the New Testament was, if Jesus was who the New Testament says he was, they would not have just asked him politely, oh, please do a trick. Oh, no, thank you. All right, you're free to go. No. They would have thrown his butt in jail. They would have tortured him. They would have kept him in prison for 20, 30 years. They would not have executed the goose that laid golden eggs. That is absurd and irrational. Uh, and in the New Testament, you have Herod waiting for a miracle. Jesus doesn't perform, so he lets him go, sends him back to uh, the other people, Pilate. That's absurd. It is totally insane. Okay. Sorry. My question is in regards to Isaiah 53. Okay. And you would say that that's about Jesus, right? Yes. Okay. So what seems more logical to you, that somebody predicted the future and that Jesus really lived, or that somebody made up a story? Because we see people borrowing so many stories throughout the Bible. So what seems more likely? That somebody just borrowed another story, or somebody was psychic and predicted the future? So the question is, could, what seems more logical to you? 
that somebody predicted the future in Isaiah 53? Yeah. It was written before Jesus, right? I believe that, that God gave that to Isaiah, and that was predicted. And that seems more logical to you, even though so many stories seem like other stories throughout the Bible? Yeah, it seems logical to me. Yeah, and I think what, what he meant was that uh, the alternative explanation is that Christians read Isaiah 53 and constructed their gospel based on it. Okay. I mean, it seems illogical that you're going to come up with a God who kind of dies in the end. I mean, Well, Isaiah 53 says the Savior is going to die, and there and is his death that actually right. secures salvation for everyone. So they, they're inspired by their own God's word to come up with the story. They don't need an, any other excuse. By God's but that, that's his point, is what okay. I'm saying. So yeah. Okay. Okay, Second Peter chapter 3, verse 4, starting where you did. Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. That does sound like Second Peter is questioning whether Christ is who he says he is, unless you bother to read just one verse ahead of that. Know this, first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come future tense, with mocking, following after their own lust. Continue from there. It predicts that people will say that. It doesn't question it. Uh, my, my point was that the author of Second Peter is referring to the apostles and the people that founded the Christian faith as being dead and gone. It is impossible for... If, if it's impossible for the Apostle Peter to have written this if he was dead. And if what's written here is true, the Apostle Peter had long since been dead. Therefore, it is physically impossible, unless you believe in time travel, that the Apostle Peter wrote this chapter in the book of Second Peter. It's impossible. Sorry. Yeah, it starts. Un unless we grant their interpretation of the argument being made there. Because they're, they're saying that the... And, and I think you could construct the argument the way they're talking about. So I think there are different ways to interpret that verse, and I would concede that. Yet it also starts, Simon Peter, it starts verse 1. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith through us, <clears throat> with us through the righteousness of God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then you go back to the next verse that you're talking about, for this they are willingly ignorant of, after he's talking about who those scoffers are, that they're willingly ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, the earth standing out of the water and in the water. So, yes, it is talking about people who, scoffers. Um, a very quick one for Mr. Hampton, then a hopefully more <laughs> complex one for Dr. Carrier. And I'm sorry if it's Dr. Hampton, not Mr. I'm not sure which it is. Okay. <laughs> Um, for you, are you a young earth creationist? Yes. Okay, thanks. Um, for, for Dr. K Dr. Carrier, um, the, the, you have the, the first guy who came up and asked you a question, I thought, hit a, a key part of the whole argument about historicity of Jesus, which is, is the absence of evidence, evidence for absence. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it occurred to me as I stood in line that there's the famous Sherlock Holmes story about the dog that didn't bark. Okay, are there are there places you would have expected documentation to occur mm -hmm. that would have reflected the existence of a Jewish preacher who was well known and who was crucified? Yeah. And is that you know? Can you cite these are the places like here's a list of everyone we executed this week. You know, right, love, no. love, love uh, Colonel whoever. Unlikely we would have that. Well, um, I don't know. Maybe, right, that's right. why I'm looking for you to, to right. tell me. The, the epistles would look very different. Uh, the epistles would be full of argumentation about what the historical Jesus said and who he said it to. Uh, and they wouldn't be written the way they're written now, where they're only talking about revelation and scripture as their only sources. They'd be talking about the testimony of people who saw Jesus and conflicts and arguments about that. Uh, so we don't see any of that in the epistles. I talk about this more in my book and the whole section on that if you want to see more examples. Earl Doherty on his website also has an actual detailed list of all the verses in Paul where you should expect uh, to see things. 
and the expectation is not 100%, right? So you can ha look at a passage and say, well, there's maybe a one in five chance he'd mention something here. But when you're looking at all the verses in Paul, the, what, the probability that all of them would lack references to a historical Jesus is much less likely than that any particular one would. Well, and I was talk there about any the, documentation of, uh, well, not, not Jesus, but we had this other preacher guy, and boy, was he an idiot. Or, uh, well, again, well, we I go back to we, 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 don't, we, we, don't we have crucified letters. this people. Didn't yeah. they keep a list of who they crucified? No, we don't have no. letters. For example, we know many messianic figures that are reported in Josephus. But we don't okay. have early letters written by their followers, for example. Uh, so, And if we did, and they were talking about them as, as celestial revelatory beings and not as people who are running around Jerusalem preaching – then we would have the same situation where the stories in Josephus would then look suspicious. We'd probably have to conclude that they began as celestial revelatory beings and only became well, historical. Was there any later. reference to these other messianic figures other than in Josephus? No, but we don't expect there to be because they don't have uh, messianic cults that became came to rule the world and decided which texts would be preserved to us, right? So if Jesus ben Ananias had started a cult that then became the dominant Western religion and decided all the texts that would survive the Middle Ages, then we'd have tons of evidence for Jesus ben Ananias because they would have preserved it. Uh, but there was no cult of Jesus Ben Ananias that gained power and, and decided which books would survive. But there was that for Jesus. So we have different expectations for Jesus than we do for other people whose cults didn't make it. Hmm. Uh, I'd like to add to that. Uh, August 6, 1945, Hiroshima ceased to exist, uh, along with all of its records, uh, deeds, property, uh, documents, etc., etc., etc. Uh, if you were wanting to write an historical, an historic novel, a, B, a BS novel, let's call it, it would have been great to place it in June or July of 1945 in Hiroshima because there would be absolutely no way to prove anything you're saying is wrong. You could say there was a guy named uh, Joe Schmo that uh, raised 500 people from the dead and walked on water and flew through the air, and there would be not one shred of evidence to contradict it. Uh, it's always struck me as a curiosity that Jerusalem and all of its records were burned to the ground and then the city was knocked flat in 70 AD. Whatever records were existing were destroyed. Uh, there's a, th that would be an extremely good vacuum of history in which to insert a Jesus. And what a curiosity that's where Jesus is in that vacuum of history. That's probably why, one big reason there's no written evidence for Jesus. Okay, thank you. Next question. Uh, <clears throat> I take it that you're, you're both atheists, and, uh, and therefore uh, I'd just like to ask you a, a basic logical question as distinct from the <clears throat> speculation that's been engaged in on this particular topic. I, I'd just like to know how you can account for the existence of the cosmos without violating the fallacy of infinite dependent regress. Uh, oh, infinite regress. Um, well, there's many different possibilities. Let's, let's hear one. Um, I mean, first of all, you can have infinite regress. No, uh, it's a logical fallacy. Infinite. No, it's not. Infinite you, dependent material regress is a logical fallacy. Look it up. No, it's this Look is, it up. This is science, relativity no, theory. No. It's entirely possible to have an infinite past. No, it isn't. Yes, it is. You're blowing it's, smoke. It's, no, it's You're really good on your speculation. No, no, I'm no, good no. on this, this topic. This is established you're wrong. mathematics. You are wrong. It's, Trans not, it's not a mathematical issue. Google There's transfinite. A there is a difference between... No. You, don't, you, you, now, I don't, you get to talk a lot, okay? You, you get it. to talk a lot. Do you I get to talk? Do I get to talk? You're, you asked me the you're question. showing you don't understand the I'm answer. There's the a question. difference between a mathematical infinity and a physical infinity. No. You can't answer the physical question. We lost audio. Sir, thank you for the question. Please allow our panelists time to answer the question. If not, I'll have to ask. He's misrepresenting. Answer. That's the okay. issue. No, no, no. Allow him to answer the question. Allow me to answer the question. Set theory establishes that if you can have a set in mathematical theory, you can have a one-to-one -one correlation of physical objects to the objects in that set. There's no you can demonstrate this as a matter of established logic. The Principia Mathematica of Bertrand Russell, for example, establishes this. So if you can have a set with infinite members, you can have a one-to-one -one correspondence of physical objects to those mathematical objects. Therefore, if you can have an infinite set in mathematics, you can have an infinite set in reality. That in is false. It is not. It it's is. Established, this is established Here, logic. Established and, and you won't allow me to explain, just like you monopolize their time most of the time. You do most of the talk, and that's how you win the argument. It's not the time to explain. Yeah, it's the time to ask questions. Yes. Thank you.
Thank yeah. you very much. Uh, it, you're I've false, dude. The question. For your question, please. You make me a promise, you'll ask a direct question? Okay. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Uh, I'm bringing this up uh, again, but I think it's so critical. The um, four Gospels, as I understand it, that uh, Irenaeus uh, had dismissed uh, other writings, other uh, traditions that were within the church at the time. And here's his thought process. I quote, they don't have any Gospels that aren't full of blasphemy. There actually are only four authentic Gospels. And this is obviously true because there are four corners of the universe and there are four principal winds. And therefore, there can only be four Gospels that are authentic. This was his thought process. And he is the one that certified the names of the Gospels. And I find that embarrassing. Comments? Uh, well, I mean, I don't know. It's an interesting thought of Arrhenius. Uh, there are four points, though. It's kind of interesting. North, east, uh, south, and west, or what it's worth. Um, you know, I, I have no real comment on Arrhenius. Uh, it's, it's an interesting thought. You know, maybe he had some insight. Maybe he didn't. Uh, but the four that we have... Are, are those four? So, uh, you know, he. I, I don't see the church as, as like cherry picking like what they wanted to be in the book. It was more of a, a stamp of approval of what was already being circulated and what was considered to be authentic. So I don't think they're like, well, we like this one, but we don't like that one. It was, the, you know, there there were some that were already considered. They were in use. They were considered authentic. And they're simply putting their stamp of approval. They're not deciding what is going to be in and what's going to be out. It's, it's you know, some things are already in existence, like the epistles. Uh, all of them, by the way, uh, all the epistles were being used. Uh, I, I'd like to add, it's interesting to me that early Christianity picked four Gospels as being authentic. And they were awash, flooded and bogus, what they consider to be bogus gospels, bogus prophets, false prophets, lies, deceivers, etc., etc. Jesus said, a good tree, you cannot get bad fruit from a good tree. There was lots of bad fruit in the origins of Christianity. How can Christianity today, having grown out of that cesspool, claim to be a good tree? I have a question. First of all, uh, on you brought up the um, the Rome or the um, Egyptian soldiers all dying in the river, and yet uh, the biggest curse was all the babies that got murdered. And it seems to me like the Egyptians didn't record all these babies that are apparently murdered by the uh, by the angel of God, and then all the babies that were out in the uh, that were killed according to uh, by Herod. That's uh, in no record, although it's a record in the gospel. And the second question, I guess babies aren't important, but the second one would be um, the Old Testament is supposed to be a witness of Christ or the coming of the Messiah. And yet uh, when Jesus comes and doesn't really <coughs> fulfill some of the main things about the lion laying down with the lamb and the swords being beaten into plowshares, uh, it would seem to me like the Old Testament, if God's going to take the time to reveal these things to these prophets, maybe he would tell he's going to come two times instead of one time and then leave us one time with really no evidence he was there. I'd like to hear your comment on that. Okay. Well, um, I mean, there is evidence that, uh, that, uh, that children die. If you look in the Ipiwar Papyrus, it does refer to that. Uh, so the, the, what we have in the... In the Tombs of the Pharaohs is simply a record of what happened that night as they were going out uh, to recapture the Israelites. So it wasn't about all the all the different plagues. But the Imperial Papyrus, if you if you read that, you will find the language is, is astounding, okay, and it talks about darkness. It talks about um, the children, uh, and of course the blood. Obviously, I only touched upon a little bit with limited time. Uh, secondly. Um, uh, you know, Jesus uh, is coming back. We understand that uh, the scriptures were not all fulfilled, but the ones that were, fu were fulfilled were fulfilled correctly and properly. Uh, and there is another phase to this whole thing. And Does the Old Testament predict two phases? 
the Old Testament re refers to him coming uh, lowly on a donkey. All right, it talks about his death. Uh, we see that in Isaiah 50, 53, Psalm 22, uh, just to mention a couple. So we see those, that he's going to be a suffering servant. Uh, we also see that he's going to be a victorious king. And, th I mean, the Jews have long understood this, but they say that it's two different messiahs. They talk about, uh, they talk about uh, Mashiach ben Yosef, and then they talk about Mashiach ben David. So, you know, you know, I would say, hey, you guys just put them together and you'll see that they're the one and the same. But they say, no, these are two different people. And that, so they've understood that. Uh, so, yes, I think the Bible does. It doesn't say, hey, by the way, guys, there's going to be two comings. It doesn't use the terminology that you would use, but it uses the terminology that, that God directed the, the authors to use. And, um, so and, is it, the purpose was to, I'm going to kind of like put it in code and you got to figure it out? Is that basically what you're Well, saying? to some extent, I mean, you know, there's a whole other side of this thing that there is this sort of cosmic battle going on. So, I mean... Uh, you know, the references that he makes to uh, the, the spiritual realm itself, that, that stuff is it's true. But, but, but he leaves it there and never comes down into the flesh where we're told very clearly that, that Jesus became flesh, okay? But there is this other side of, of reality that we can't see, but it is there. And there is uh, a, a battle that's going on. And so there's a lot of stuff that happens that had to take place to resolve all those issues too. Thank you for your time, both of you. Part of uh, my, my question basically is I'm going to say a couple of things, and, uh, and I'd like to you to comment on them. But if you would extend me the grace of completing what I have to say, I'll make it very short. Uh, one, one thing that seems to be happening is that there's a lot of argument based on the lack of evidence of something. But that is what is known as an argument from silence. And that's a logical fallacy. One example was when you were discussing Paul, you were saying that uh, because Paul did not quote certain things that were in the Gospels, that therefore that, that weakened his case. It may have weakened his case, but you can't, is it, is it not true that you cannot conclude from that, uh, make a firm conclusion that Paul was in the state that you said he was. And I'll sit down and let you. Um, yeah. Uh, no, the argument from silence is not a fallacy. Uh, it has to be structured as an argument to probability. So you don't get a logically deductive proof out of it. Uh, the question is, and I, I actually analyze the logical structure of arguments from silence and explain when they're valid and when they're not in proving history. Uh, in that one book, I have a whole section on argument from silence and the logic of it. The basic idea is is you compare two probabilities. The probability that there would be silence in a source if a certain thing happened, and the probability that there would be the si that same silence if the thing didn't happen. If those two probabilities are the same, then yes, then the argument from silence can't proceed. But if those probabilities differ, then the strength of the argument from silence is, ba is proportional to the difference between those two probabilities. So if a silence in a document is extremely unlikely, then that silence is evidence for absence. And the, the example, one of the main examples I give in that is the three-hour darkening of the sun that's in Mark. If that had happened, the probability that it would not be mentioned by astronomers and historians all throughout the Roman Empire is exceedingly small. Therefore, the probability that it happened is exceedingly small. Uh, so you can build lo uh, legitimate arguments from silence, but you, you have to do them in a logically correct way. Not all arguments from silence are valid, uh, and they vary in their validity. It's not like it's either true or false, uh, you get degrees of probability based on the strength of the argument. Hi, thank you all. Um, my question is for the Christian friends that are here. Um, no doubt you have different um, views upon, well, the big questions uh, compared to Dr. Carrier, uh, not just about the historicity of Jesus and whether or not he existed or miracles, even God. My question is simply, if Dr. Carrier's worldview is correct, how would our world today be any different? Well, our world would be very, very different, of course. Um, I mean, I would argue that we wouldn't be here because without a creator, I find it very hard to get here, just like you can't have a building without a builder. So I think that's the basic uh, big problem, uh, the sort of a cosmic problem, if you will. 
but if we're only going to assume that, that, that there is no Jesus, but maybe there's still some creator or something, um, you know, I, it, it's hard to say what the world would look like. Uh, I would presume that there would be, uh, well, I mean, it's, it's complete speculation, so I, it seems dangerous to even go what, to see what the world would, would be like. Uh, I will say this, though. Uh, what would the world be like if we had actually followed the things Jesus had told us to do? All right, because I, I know that there's a lot of, a lot of things have been done in Jesus' name that are heinous, and they, they make me cringe. And when I hear about things that, uh, what people have done in, in, in Jesus' name, it makes me very sad, and, uh, and I would suppose it would make Jesus very sad as well. But uh, if we, you know, if we loved our neighbor as we're supposed to, uh, which is, of course, in the Torah, right? We're supposed to love the Lord with all our heart, mind, and soul, and strength, and also to love our neighbor as ourselves. If we just do those two things, I think the world would be a very different place. And one reason that Jesus came, among others, but one was to teach us how to live and to demonstrate how to do that. So, um, you know, just looking at his, his moral teachings, I, I think the world would be a, a poorer place uh, without what he, what he said. Not what his followers have done necessarily, but what he actually taught. Last question. Thank you all. Doug, you mentioned that the Bible is a collection of 66 books written by 40 or more authors. The first five books, the Pentateuch, contains a series of seeming contradictions. Who do you think wrote those books and based on what evidence? Thank yeah, you. thank you. That's a great question. Uh, the book of Genesis, uh, I would argue, is actually, uh, you know, we talk about the redactor sometimes. I believe the redactor is none other than Moses himself uh, and that he has source documentation. And that is demonstrated by the word toledot, uh, which we translate as account. But... Um, you know, you're looking at source source documents. So it talks about you know this is the the account or the story of uh, creation. This is a sto source of story of Adam and Eve, of Seth, of Noah, etc. So you know, whereas I mean, there's different theories about how Genesis was written. One is that it's the dictation theory that God said, "Okay, Moses, get out a pen, and I'm going to just tell you what happened." I can't rule that out, but I think it's rather improbable. I think it's more likely that Moses being learned in all the ways of the Egyptians, uh, which he would have also have known um, cuneiform, it's almost certain that he knew cuneiform as well, uh, as a learned Egyptian, that you know he would have had access to, to documents. Now, I can't provide those documents to you. I can only show you from the evidence that seems to be there. Because we have little internal evidences such as uh, that, you know, that Jacob was in Bet El, which was formerly called Luz. Okay, so there's little editorial notes that seem to uh, suggest that it was compiled by someone uh, who, well, the redactor, but that redactor was in fact Moses. And that's been the long-held tradition. That's what Jesus talked about. I see no other reason to suggest that it was anybody but Moses. So, thank you. Thank you very much. A round of applause for the question and answer session. So as we come to a close on the historicity, historicity of Jesus, we've heard evidence against and evidence for, and now the closing segment. Mr. Timer, David Lehman will go first. His time will be 10 minutes. The final closing will be from Dr. Carrier. His time will be 10 minutes. I did notice in the opening session, Dr. Carrier did take an extra four minutes. So if there is a little grace there, I'll watch the timer. So Dr. David yeah, Lehman. Actually, you can subtract those four from my closing. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. So you officially have, we're rounding up to 15 minutes. Is that enough time? That would be helpful. And are you ready? Oh, okay, so he'll do 15, I'll do 10. That's fine. Okay, okay. thanks. Well, you've probably been wondering if I can actually talk. No, there's no doubt about it, David. <laughs> um, can you show my slides? Okay. I'm going to go really fast so you can kind of follow me. Uh, I'd like to look at the evidence for Jesus, first of all, from non-biblical sources, 
first of all, we got Flavius Josephus in his Antiquities, Cornelius Tacitus in Annals, uh, Annals and then Lucian of Sam Samosata in the Jewish Sanhedrin. Now let's just start with Lucian of Samosata. The Christians, this is a quote from him, the Christians worship a man, and of course he was very anti-Christian, so you can see his attitude is coming through here. Worship a man to this day, the distinguished personage who introduced this new cult and was crucified on that account. You see, these misguided creatures start with the general conviction that they are immortal for all time, which explains their contempt for, the, for death and self-devotion. Their lawgiver taught they are all brothers from the moment that they are converted and deny the gods of Greece and worship the crucified sage and lived after his uh, laws. All this they take on faith. This is in the passing of Peregrinus. Now, that was kind of an interesting story, but I won't get into it. This reference reveals several things. The Christians worship Jesus. Jesus was crucified for what he taught. Jesus was started Christianity. Jesus' disciples believed Jesus' teachings. And many Christians taught that when one was converted, that he or she had eternal life. They lived by faith. They believed in Jesus. Flavius Josephus. Now, there are some that disputed, but the ones that are not disputed, Josephus must have mentioned Jesus in the authentic core material in 1863, since this passage in the present in all, is present in all Greek manuscripts of Josephus, and the Agapian version accords well with his vocabulary and grammar elsewhere. Moreover, Jesus is portrayed as a wise man of phrase not used by Christians, but employed by Josephus for such Old Testament figures as David and Solomon. Josephus' second reference to Jesus in connection with the death of his half-brother James shows no tampering, whatever, and is present in all Josephus' manuscripts, nor could the New Testament have served as Josephus' source since it provides no deal, de detail on James' death. The Talmud teaches that Jesus Christ was illegitimate. Of course, they were not real f friendly with Jesus and was conceived during the menstruation that, that he had a soul of Esau, that he was a fool, a conjurer, a seducer, that he was crucified, buried in hell, and set up in, as an idol. Uh, in other words, he, he did his miracles by sorcery, they said. That's why he was burning in hell and excrement. Uh, that the Jews understand this story to refer to Jesus, and the mother of Mary is clearly demonstrated in their book, uh, Toldeth Deshu, the generations of Jesus, where the birth of Jesus is narrated. So, in the Gospels, we see that Jesus healed a man with leprosy, Peter's mother-in-law, the Roman centurion's servant, two men from Gadara, a paralyzed man, a woman with bleeding, two blind men, a man mute and possessed, a man with shriveled hand, and a blind man uh, mute and possessed. He healed a Canaanite woman's daughter who suffered greatly, a boy with a demon, two other blind men, one named a deaf mute, a man possessed with, in the synagogue, a blind man at Bethsaida, a crippled woman, a man with dropsy, ten men with leprosy, a high priest servant, the official son at Capernaum, the sick man at the pool of Bethesda, and a man born blind. He had complete control over the forces of nature. He calmed the storms, walked on water, and fed 5,000 people here and 4,000 people there just from a few loaves and fish. He withered a fig tree, turned water into wine, and produced miraculous catches of fish. He even brought the dead back to life, including Jairus' daughter, the widow's son at Nain, and Lazarus. And the, as the Apostle John emphasized, there were only a few of Christ's miracles. If Jesus never did these miracles, and yet early apostles and Christians falsely claimed he did, don't you think they would have proven him a fraud? The people were still alive. And regardless of what he says, this, these Mark and Matthew were written about somewhere in the 50s to 60s. And of course, the people were still alive. They saw this. Uh, no founder of any religion claimed to be God or perform miracles. No other prophet or founder of any religion had detailed prophecies concerning his coming, his life, his death, and his resurrection. We talked about, I lived in Salt Lake and debated Mormons for almost a year. Uh, Grant Palmer, who wrote a book, uh, The uh, Insider, View, Insider's View of Mormonism, has told, and he grew up with the 12 apostles today, said that none of the apostles today believe that Joseph Smith was a prophet. Wenhelm Weil, I had his book, he actually interviewed, he was a German medical doctor, and he went and interviewed people in uh, starting <clears throat> all the way through uh, the, from Palmyra, New York, all the way to Salt Lake City, 80 people, all of them said that Joseph Smith was basically uh, a very unsavory character. Mohammed, the Quran, uh, Mark Gabriel, a friend of mine, was, was the head of the, uh, the Department of Religion and uh, 
history in Alcazar University in Cairo, and he said Muhammad was a, you know, as we all probably realize, that he was a terrorist. And so almost every person that we look at any other religion, we look at the founder, and they were not people that were doing miracles, not claiming to be sinless. William Law, a member of the First Presidency, is, uh, this was one of the last things that happened before Joseph Smith's untimely death. And according to William Law, Smith had several proposals to Law's wife, Jane, under the premise that Jane would enter a polyandrous marriage with Smith. And this was what was supposed to be published in the Nauvoo Expositor the very next day before Joseph Smith had the presses destroyed. According to Richard Carrier, now this is evidence for us, now this is from other books that he's written, God should be much more involved with the world. And he thinks he shouldn't have made an imperfect universe. God shouldn't remain hidden. Instead, he should appear to all people at all times so that everyone would know that he exists. These are apparent injustices that seem to be, from my perspective, Richard's only substantial objection to theism. In his monthly column, Skeptic for Scientific American, Michael Shermer has proposed an interesting principle, affectionately named Shermer's Last Law. It states that any sufficient advanced extraterrestrial intelligence is indistinguishable from God. Hence, if any advanced alien were to come to Earth and dazzle us with advanced technology, the alien would seem like God, of course. Of course, this implies the reverse is also true. If God appeared to the entire world tomorrow morning, he would be indistinguishable from an advanced alien. Hence, according to Shermer's last law, God could never, even in principle, give enough evidence for everyone to conclude that he exists. Even in the face of a barrage of miracles or parting of the Pacific Ocean, the skeptic would be free to say, wow, those are great uh, aliens are pretty amazing, aren't they? There always been a way out for non-believers. Jesus' enemies attributed his mir miracles to Beelzebub. And, of course, Carrie attributes the origin of life to natural causes and the resurrection of Jesus to an incredible ensemble of mass hallucinations. Shermer offers an invincible piece of armor for the skeptic who can never be sure that their God exists. Nevertheless, there is one way for God to prove his existence to everyone. He could take away our free will. We'd all become Calvinists. <laughs> Whether we like it or not, hence all atheist demands, you know, and all atheist demands for certainty are ultimately objections to God's gift of free will. I mean, they don't have to believe. Bearing the elimination of choice, there is nothing God could do to convince an impassioned skeptic armed with Shermer's last law. We would even imagine skeptic living in a world of cosmic miracles, appearing, appealing to arguments similar to Richard's. If God really loved me, he wouldn't leave me in doubt as to whether these miracles I'm seeing are from God or an alien. Surely a good God would never leave us confused to his existence. Besides this, God seems to be forcing himself on everyone when he knows that we can't even be certain that he exists. If I were God, I wouldn't force myself on ignorant people. Should he hold us responsible for a choice we can't reasonably deny or make? Of course not. Hence, even in this, if this God is real, he's immoral, unfit for worship. It seems, then, that an atheist can never be sure God exists, regardless of what God does. So Richard's accusations can't mean that God should prove himself to everyone. This means that when it comes to things like the existence of God or evidence for miracles, Richard must demand something less than certainty. Now, consider Richard's argument, and I almost hesitate to throw this, but it's kind of fun. <laughs> Richard's argument is that breasts are evidence for the non-existence of God. Female breasts do not need to be large or prominent at all as instruments for nursing. Small breasts are just as effective, while large breasts create increased strain or on a woman's back and increased risk of injury or lethal malfunctions like cancer. They are liability, a needless waste of energy. What possible use such an inefficient tactic would have in the eyes of an intelligent engineer are hard to fathom. Oddly, he dedicates his book to Jen, my bucks and brunette. Nevertheless, compared to some of his other arguments, Richard's arguments from large breasts are an absolute masterpiece. I thought you might like a little humor here. <laughs> so he goes so far as to claim that something that doesn't fly out of his butt must not exist. Now, this was a response to um, email. Since there is no observable divine hand in nature as a causal process, it is reasonable to conclude there is no divine hand. After all, there are no blue monkeys flying out of my butt. It's sufficient reason to believe there are no such creatures, and so, so it is with anything else. So this may be the worst argument ever offered by anyone. But anyway, presumably there are no monkeys of any color flying out of Richard's butt. Are we to conclude that monkeys don't exist? Neither are there fire trucks, books, planets, horses, bees, or anything emerging. These things still exist, 
In his debate with Michael Lacona, Richard laid out his case against the resurrection. In this case, he summed it up as follows. Jesus died on a cross. His disciples, longing to make sense of the tragedy, searched the scriptures and concluded that his death had meaning. Several of Jesus' followers experienced hallucinations in which they saw visions of the risen Christ telling them that everything was okay. For some reason, and Richard never explains why, these disciples concluded that Jesus had been resurrected without his earthly body, a radical concept for first century Jews. When Christianity began to spread, Saul of, Tarsus, Saul of Tarsus, a devout Pharisee, attempted to destroy Christianity. Nevertheless, he also experienced a hallucination in which Jesus told him to convert to Christianity. Strangely, Paul also adopted the radical view that Jesus' earthly body wasn't resurrected. A few decades later, some Christians made up an empty tomb story to illustrate their belief that Jesus' body was empty of his spirit, but they forgot to tell everyone that it was only a story. Later, Christians took the invent invention and seriously concluded that there was really an empty tomb and that Jesus' body must have been involved in the resurrection. Normally, a Jewish, Jewish view would say that. Now, note the Jewish understanding of spiritual resurrection was practically an oxymoron. And third, in the Jewish idea that the body that dies is the same body that rises. Now, there's an overwhelming evidence against such a position. Nevertheless, Richard's problem is far greater than mere evidence, which he is free to twist to his liking. The main problem with his view is that he's completely inconsistent with his belief that Jesus never existed. Prior to his debate with Lacona, Richard said Jesus might have existed, but until better historicist view is advanced, I have to conclude at least somewhat more probable that Jesus didn't exist than he did. Then at the debate, Richard argued, there are many theories contrary to what Mr. Lacona has argued, but there isn't time tonight to look at them all. I will instead present the one theory I think is most probably correct, which I only have time to summarize. Shortly after the death of Jesus, his disciples prayed, meditated, and searched the scriptures for some meaning to justify the tragedy in some way to preserve and promote the noble program of more reform Jesus had died for. As a result, some had prophetic dreams or visions in which Jesus appeared to them, reassuring them and telling them just what they wanted to hear. Since the debate, Richard again argues that Jesus never existed. Thus, we have a problem. Richard believes that Jesus probably never existed, but he also says that he thinks the, the, that most probably correct is that Jesus' disciples experienced visions of him after he died. Putting these two views together, we have this. Jesus never existed. Nevertheless, he had close companions who did exist. If you're wondering how a person who didn't exist could have followers, you may be forgetting that non-existent people can be very, very persuasive. These followers became extremely distraught when Jesus, who didn't exist, was tortured and crucified by Roman soldiers who did exist. Jesus, who didn't exist, may or may not have been placed in a tomb which may or may not have existed. After the death of their non-existent leader, the minds of the followers were so overcome by emotions that they soon experienced grief, hallucinations in which they saw visions of the risen Jesus, whom nobody had ever seen to begin with. Strangely, these disciples came to believe that Jesus was resurrected without a body, probably because non-existent people don't have bodies. This caused them to become bold evangelists of the risen Lord that they had never seen. James, who did exist, the brother of Jesus, also experienced grief hallucinations when he heard that his brother, who didn't exist, had been nailed to a cross, many of which did exist. James joined the other followers, and the group became so bold that it attracted the attention of a man named Saul, who did exist. While Saul wanted to destroy Christianity because it went against everything he believed in, he was overwhelmingly attracted to the humble message of social reform. So, anyway... It gives you a little bit of an idea, but let's look at the resurrection. The importance of the resurrection for Christianity is absolutely, uh, you know, I mean, I'm just getting started with my talk here. The bodily resurrection of Jesus from the dead is a crowning proof of Christianity. Death is the greatest enemy, and it's conquered all men but Christ. No man is wise enough to outwit death or wealthy enough to purchase freedom from death or strong enough to vanquish death. The grave always wins the victory. In fact, death applies not only to people, but to all things. Animals die, plants die, species become extinct, and even cities and nations, like people, are born, grow up for a season, and then fade away. Homes, cars, clothes, the universe itself are all subject to the universal law of decay and death, bondage or corruption. The uniqueness of the resurrection seen in even the greatest religious figures, Buddha, Muhammad, Zoroaster, Confucian, Caesar, all of these died and stayed dead. The early preaching almost always included the resurrection. We can see this. The final book, Revelation, opens with Christ's identification of himself as the first begotten of the dead, as the one that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. The resurrection caught the disciples completely by surprise. In fact, they were frightened when they saw him, thinking that they were seeing a ghost. <coughs> 
Here we have passages showing that others that the Messiah would be put to death and rise again, even if the disciples had not been able to anticipate the resurrection from the Old Testament passages, they had clear statements from Christ's own words seen in Matthew 12, and yet they still didn't realize it. But not only that, but you have the, the uh, counting of the Omar in the appearances of Christ. He appeared to Mary Magdalene and Mark, to the other women, to Peter, to two on the road to Emmaus, to the disciples, to 11 disciples, uh, eight days later, to uh, seven disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, to five, over 500 followers, and these were usually men, so we're probably talking about over 2,000 people, to James, to the 11 at the Ascension. There are supposed contradictions in the stories. The historical truth of, an, of this event is proven by the combined evidences of the empty tomb, the numerous appearances, the change in the lives of the disciples. If they had an opportunity, if nobody's going to die for what they know to be a lie. The, uh, the authenticity of the records, not, a men not to mention the, the testimony of 2,000 years of Christian history. Thomas Arnold, prof former professor of history at Rugby in Oxford, was one of the greatest historians the world has ever known. His, his testimony is, I know of one fact, no one fact in history of mankind which has proved better, fuller evidence of, by better, fuller evidence of every sort to the understanding of a fair inquirer, fair inquirer that the great sign which God hath given us that Christ died and rose again from the dead. The whole book of Jonah illustrates that he was buried and rose again on the third day. We see the smitten rock out of which flowed water is a picture of Christ's death, and the living water is a picture of life giving power. We got the picture of the types of Christ, the Mose Tosh bag, the three compartments, the middle one, of course, in hidden. And uh, the picture final, uh, in Genesis 22 represents a picture of Christ, type of Isaac being offered up on the altar and raised again from the dead on the third day from the time that he left. Abraham received Isaac back again. Thank you. Another round of applause, please, for Dr. Layman. Thank you. And now, closing arguments from Dr. Carrier here. And please be mindful of the six minutes. Six minutes. Okay. Mr. Tyler? Very good. Uh, we're not here debating the existence of God, so all of that's irrelevant. Uh, I've never really actually argued that God didn't exist, and God's existence is not relevant to whether Jesus existed as a person or not. Uh, so we're going to skip that. Uh, also, uh, he got extremely garbled. My arguments about the resurrection got a lot of that inaccurate, uh, but it's particularly bizarre because he's referring to work I wrote in 2005, which was when I actually was convinced that there was a historical Jesus. My conclusion changed on that several years later. Uh, so him, by conflating those two as if I was simultaneously promoting both views, uh, is a distortion of history, first of all. So all of that can be dismissed. That's actually irrelevant now as well. Uh, I should also point out that he talked about the empty tomb. Paul never mentions anyone finding an empty tomb, even in the passage in which he gives reasons to believe in the resurrection. Reasons to believe in the resurrection and the empty tomb being found doesn't even make the list. Uh, so the idea of there being an empty tomb appears to be a later invention just by that evidence alone. Uh, he mentions gospel miracles. Of course, he's referring to the gospels. I really challenge you to read chapter 10 of my book on the historicity of Jesus. Uh, that will completely alter your view of what is going on in these miracle stories and where they came from and what the authors were doing with them. But most importantly, there's no evidence any apostles, any of the apostles that, that Paul refers to, for example, ever claimed any of these miracles occurred. Paul never refers to Jesus performing any miracles. There's no discussion of that in there. In fact, in Philippians, Paul says that Jesus divested himself of all powers and became the lowest possible being, subjecting himself to the status of a slave, not meaning a literal slave, but slave to the universe. That verse practically denies that Jesus had any miraculous powers. He's saying that Jesus abandoned all the powers of a god and became an ordinary person. Uh, so. With that and all the other evidence, there doesn't seem to be any evidence of miracle working uh, in the epistles. That only starts to appear in the Gospels, and then we have these wildly fabulous tales uh, that are no different than many similar tales told of other gods and heroes and sorcerers of the era. So that doesn't really get us anywhere either. Then that leaves us with the people he started with. He talks about Josephus, Tacitus, Lucian, Sanhedrin. Uh, one of my favorite, uh, Toledoth Yeshu, is actually a medieval work, uh, but it is based on uh, the Babylonian Talmud. 
uh, which is he's talking about Sanhedrin. It's not a source. Uh, it's not people. It's a reference to a book of the Talmud um, called Sanhedrin, which is a book on the commentary on the Mishnah about the Sanhedrin, which is about how the Sanhedrin would conduct itself. But the Talmud adds commentaries in it. But the Babylonian Talmud, which is the only Talmud that references Jesus, places Jesus 100 years before, does not have him executed by Pontius Pilate, but by agents of Alexander Janias 100 years or many years before the Romans even invaded. Uh, so they're actually placing Jesus in a different historical period. They also say he was executed in Joppa, not in Jerusalem, and there are many other accounts that he was executed by stoning, for example, and so on. It's a radically different story, but this story is first written down and first heard of uh, in 4th or 5th century AD. Uh, so you can make of that what you will. I do discuss it more with sources in On the History of the City of Jesus, but it is bizarre that the Babylonian Jews had only heard of a Christianity that put Jesus 100 years before the canonical Gospels do. How does that happen to a historical person? It's very unlikely. It's more likely that that happened because we had a non-historical person. People outside the Roman Empire came up with a different historical period to put him in. People inside the Roman Empire came up with their own version based on the Roman uh, situation at the time. Uh, so that's actually evidence for the non-existence of, of Jesus. He talks about Lucian, uh, Lucian of Samosata. He wrote 160 AD. Let me repeat that, 160 AD, long after. This is over 100 years after uh, Jesus would have lived. And all he's doing, and he explicitly says all he's doing, is just repeating what Christians told him. That's not usable as evidence. Uh, all the Christians are doing is just repeating the Gospels at him. And the Gospels, of course, we're talking about books written half a century before Lucian wrote, so that's not usable. That's All that does is prove that the Gospels were circulating at the time. That doesn't prove that the Gospels said anything that's true. He talks about Tacitus. We already talked about that plenty earlier in the debate, so I think that's covered. Uh, if you want to hear more about all of these, by the way, my book, again, I have a whole chapter just on these, these people. And then he gets to Josephus. Again, uh, that doesn't prove anything because the material in Josephus, even if it's authentic, can only be coming from Christian tradition. In fact, uh, it's been proved in the peer-reviewed literature that the main passage in Josephus is derived from the Gospel of Luke. In other words, it's using Luke as a source. I think that's better explained by it being a Christian interpolation, but even if Josephus suddenly became a really terrible writer and wrote a really terrible paragraph based on the Gospel according to Luke, uh, all he's doing is that. Uh, that is not independent corroboration of the Gospel of Luke. Uh, and if you want that source, by the way, again, in my book, I cite uh, the scholarship on this, establishing that that actually comes from Christian sources, comes from the Gospels. It's not independent corroboration. Even if his passage about James uh, is authentic, all he's doing is repeating what Christians were telling him, that there was a James called the brother of the Lord or brother of the Christ, which doesn't give you any indication whether that they were saying that it was biological or cultic. Josephus wouldn't know. But in fact, it's very unlikely that Josephus actually mentioned Christ in that passage, I have a paper in, under, in a peer-reviewed academic journal uh, establishing this quite conclusively. Uh, in my book, Hitler, Homer, Bible Christ, it contains that paper, also my peer-reviewed paper on Tacitus and various other uh, authors who've written on Jesus. But uh, in this particular case, he just mentions uh, James being the brother of the one called Christ. The weird thing about that is that Josephus never refers to the word Christ anywhere in his book, and we know, and anywhere in many, any of his books. And we know when he brings up weird terminology like that, he explains it to his Gentile readers, because the book he explicitly says was written for Gentiles. The fact that he doesn't stop and explain what a Christ is, uh, is dead on evidence that he did not write that passage. Because if Josephus wrote it, he would go, oh, but this is what a Christ is, and this is why this guy's being called the brother of the Christ, or this is why it, this story is going on. Only a Christian who is adding that, that line would not think that he had to explain what a Christ was. Uh, so that actually is demonstrably a Christian interpolation. Uh, it was added later. And he mentions that all it's in all manuscripts, but we know for a fact, and we've demonstrated this, that all manuscripts of Josephus derive from a single manuscript, which is the one used by Eusebius in the third century, or in the early fourth century. And uh, we know that contain, contained material that was not present in the same library a hundred years earlier when Origen was reading Josephus in that same library that Eusebius was using. Origen is unaware of the passages that Eusebius suddenly discovers. Uh, in the manuscripts a hundred years later. All manuscripts that we have today derive from that one manuscript that Eusebius had, uh, whether he's the one who doctored it or someone in the library hundred in that hundred year period did, uh, we don't know, but the fact that all of them are simply deriving from one manuscript, you can't use a hundred copies of one document to corroborate that one document. So that pretty much gets rid of all of the evidence they brought today. I mean, there's nothing else, essentially. And uh, I'm not even going to use the rest of my time because I think I've adequately refuted uh, everything that's been presented today. But I'll close with uh, just a simple appeal, which is the fact that obviously in this debate you can't have 
seen every argument played out to its conclusion. Uh, there are many questions you may have. There are many other pieces of evidence that weren't even brought up on either side of this debate today. So the question can't be resolved by this debate, and we should be, understand that that's how all debates work. Uh, so I highly encourage you to get my books or research this in other re respects, get their books or whatever books they recommend, compare the two, and s make a judgment based on the different scholarship and the different fact claims and so on. Uh, find out what the facts are. Uh, pursue this debate yourself individually uh, through your own study and understanding and take time doing that. And I would highly encourage you to do that so that you have a, a good informed take on this whole question. Thank you. Thank you again. Yeah. Another round of applause for all of our panelists. <laughs> On behalf of the Christian Century Toastmasters Club, as well as Backyard Skeptics, it has been my pleasure, Della Mahone, to serve as your moderator. And now I would like to invite Bruce back up. He has a few comments for you before you leave. Bruce. And you are more than welcome to be our next moderator. Very elegant. Uh, you have obviously skills in uh, your Toastmaster. Group, I could tell I need a little bit of training in that respect, so maybe I'll visit the Christian's Toastmasters. That would be a unique situation, wouldn't it? Okay. Well, just got a couple things to wrap up. Uh, I think Richard said it right on, whether you're an atheist or a Christian or a Buddhist or a Hindu, it's always good to get alternative views. I can imagine somebody walking in here totally neutral, no type of knowledge about atheism or Christianity, and just getting whammed with this evidence and, from both sides. So... Uh, I think that it's intellectually honest to say that it's always wise not to go with that 100%, but always have a little bit of doubt because if you have a little bit of doubt, you're going to actually study and discover where your doubt lies. So I think that uh, that's kind of a skeptic's kind of thing. Uh, science is never 100%. My beliefs are never 100%. You'll ever ask an atheist of any type of uh, a studied atheist. He is never 100%, sometimes pretty close. Dave, you really got me tonight. I mean, the butt jokes might have gone a little bit too far, but I loved them. You got to laugh out of me, you know? So that's, that's just great. So um, that's pretty much it. That's it. Let's go to dinner. If you're, if you're interested in discussing it further, we're going to be at Norm's. Last time we had a couple big tables there. Always great uh, entertainment and discussion uh, to continue, and I really wish that uh, you can come to more of these debates. This has been one of the best ones yet. It is online on backyardskeptics.com. Sorry, Christians, you have to go to my site to see it. <laughs> oh, wait a second, John's back there, or Dave's back there. What, where, what is it gonna be on, Dave? What is it gonna be on, what streaming is it gonna be on? Working on it, okay, well, it might be on that side too, but it's in its entirety unedited, of course. Thanks once again, let's give a big round for these guys, okay? Yeah.